All right, volume of revolution. So the idea that we're going to do right now is we're going to look at any function, and any function we can find the area under the curve. So for example, over here, if you went from A to B, you could find the area underneath this curve. We'll color it in green. So the integral finds that area under that curve. Now, the idea is, is if you take something and rotate it 360 degrees about the x-axis, what's going to happen is you're going to create a circle here and a circle here. And in fact, no matter where you cut a little thin slice, does it make sense? that there's going to be a circle at that thin slice. So if we think back to some of the ideas that we used, even for finding the volume of a cylinder, I said one of the ways you can remember the formula for volume of a cylinder is you just imagine a bunch of circles stacked on top of each other, and sure enough, the formula for the volume of a cylinder is one circles pi r squared times by the height, which would be the stack of all of those circles put together, would give you your volume. So now we're going to take that same sort of idea and apply it to new shapes like this one. If every little bit, every little cross section is a circle, if we can find the area of all of those circles and add them up as we're going along, we're going to get the volume of this shape. Well, for each one of these circles, you know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. And for each one of these circles, the radius changes as the function changes. But the radius is whatever the function is at that point. Now, in order to get what the function is at that point and the area under that curve, you're going to need to take the integral. And then if you do the integral and include the pi r squared to that, then you're going to get the volume for calculating any kind of shape, as long as you can find the curve of it. In fact, we'll be able to do really interesting shapes, like the second one that you see there with the blue. If you have one function, here I have f of x on the top, and I have another function of g of x right here. And if I take the volume of the one and I subtract the volume of the other one, I'm going to be left with the volume that's left. And you can see that makes sort of like a bell. So we're going to find out that we can find volumes of shapes that really you thought there was no way that you could create a mathematical formula to figure this out. And we're going to be able to find these volumes quite easily just using our integration and just using the fact that we know pi r squared. So what is it going to look like? So here's an example. We're going to draw a picture. Here's a graph of x cubed. We're going to look at what happens between 1 and 2. So we have the point 1, comma 1 here. Wow, 2, comma 8 there. So we're going to take that initial shape and we're going to rotate it 360 degrees. So we're going to try and make this into a three-dimensional picture. This is where my art skills are really not going to show up, but we're going to try the best that we can. Okay. I'm going to take this line here and rotate it 360 degrees. Oh, that's not actually that bad. Okay. The second one is going to be the challenge. I need to make it go the same distance down, so it's going to have to go through about that point there. I have to make the circle about at the same you know, because three-dimensional, you're kind of turning your picture. Here we go.
Thanks, actually. I'm pretty happy with that. So this curve here, this curve here would also show up there. And we wouldn't actually be able to see much of the side of it because I made my original big circle really huge. So what I'm going to, as far as coloring things go, I'm going to color this circle that circle that's the big circle that you see now I'm going to try and color the sides of this shape in purple does it make sense that the only side of the shape that you would see is there because that big circle is so huge Now, can you kind of visualize sort of a big horn kind of shape? Like a speakerphone that maybe could project lots of volume. One of those old megaphones or something. So it kind of has that shape. Now we're going to find the volume of this as a complete solid. So we're going to find the integral from 1 to 2 of pi r squared. And r, the radius, is always x cubed, and that's going to get squared. So you notice in the formula, often people bring the pi out in front because it is just a constant. So you can do that and just multiply by pi in the end because that's going to make things easier. x cubed squared becomes x to the 6. And when we integrate this, we get x to the 7 over 7. So plugging that in, we're going to have 2 to the 7 is 128, and 1 to the 7. Hundred and twenty seven over seven pi is the volume of that shape, whatever units we have cubed. So again, the idea itself isn't that crazy. All we're doing is we were figuring out each of those circles separately and adding them all up. Now Thinking of doing that slowly would be hard to do, but that's the beauty of calculus, is that idea of getting things smaller and smaller and smaller, and then adding them all up, putting them together, and we get our volume. Just like that. So I'd like you to try this one. Try to draw the picture as best as you can. All right. So there's our square root graph. It's been shifted 1 to the right, so it's going to start at 1, 0. When x is equal to 5, it's going to go through the point 5, comma 2. And if you rotate that 360 degrees, you'll have a circle here, which I've shaded in yellowy orange. And then I shaded the body of it in red. And you can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. Kind of looks like a big ham bone or something. So now that we've got our shape, if we set that into our volume, pi r squared, because that's a circle, our radius is always a function of the square root of x minus 1. And the nice thing here is when you square that, the square root goes away. It's an easy integral to do. And then you can just plug in 5 and plug in 1 and subtract them. And 
simplifying the volume of your ham is 8 pi. All right, now we're just going to have a little bit of fun, see the power of this new idea, of this new concept. I'm going to draw axes here. I'm going to draw this horizontal line. And if you pick two points on that horizontal line, say here and here, or let's just use one, one as the x-axis at 0. And I rotated that 360 degrees. What shape would I get? I'd get a cylinder. Can you see that if I rotated that part 360? I'm going to make this look really pretty. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Nice. It's going to make a cylinder. That'll be the edge of it. And there's our body. Now, if that's a cylinder, what are the two things that we need in order to figure out? Like cylinders are different, right? Cylinders are different because some are longer than others and some are wider than others. So when we're looking at our cylinder formula, we always have a radius because this part right here is our radius. And we always have a height because this section right here is our height. So now if we wanted to create a formula for the volume of a cylinder using calculus, we would say, well, wherever this line is, it's always equal to my radius. So that's my equation of that horizontal line is y equals r. If the radius is 3, that line would be y equals 3. The height is always my two endpoints. I'm going to go from 0 up to h, and that'll give me the height of my cylinder. So if I just use those parameters, instead of using actual numbers, use h as one number and r as the other number, we would have that the volume of this shape is going to be the integral from 0 to h. My function is always r squared. Does that make sense? And our integral is always dx. So r here is a number. It's not a variable. It's not changing throughout. We are just using it to represent that it's some number. When we're integrating this, we'll go from 0 to h. If this is just a number, for example, if this was 3 squared, you'd have 9. What would the integral be of 9? 9x. So if this is just a number and it's r squared, the integral of it with respect to x will be r squared x. And now if we evaluate this from 0 to h, plugging in h for x and 0 for x, we get squared h. And since we used any value for h and any value for r, we can say that this is going to work for any cylinder. Now, the cylinder formula is one where you would say, well, I still like your idea before of just counting circles up, and that, for me, was a good visualization. 
And yeah, this is nice that we can do it with calculus, but I'm, I'm good with my cylinder formula because I feel like it makes sense to me. But we can do some other formulas that kind of before we were like, well, why, why does that happen? So for example, what would happen if I took something like that function? And I picked, from again, from 0 up to a certain value. What shape did I just make? I just made a cone. We just made a cone. What are the two things that define a cone? Well, it has a radius right there. If we make that radius bigger or smaller, that makes that cone wider or narrower. And it has a height right here. Now, those could be numbers. If we wanted to, we could put in 5 for the radius and 10 for the height and use calculus to figure this out. But the thing that we need to find, if we want to find a formula using calculus, is what's the equation of this line? What's the b value going to be? 0, because I made it go right through the origin. You wouldn't have to write that plus 0, but we'll do that for now. What's the slope? r over h. So if we had used 5 and 10, then the slope would be 1 half. Okay. Now what are we going to do? We're going to find our volume is going to be the integral from 0 to h of r over h times x dx, all squared. Because your function becomes the radius of your circle, and the radius becomes squared. So if I simplify that, r squared x squared over h squared dx. Again, the r and the h are just numbers. They're just parameters that are there. The only thing that we would be integrating with is with that x. Integrating an x squared isn't too bad, is it? You add 1 to the exponent and divide. And all of a sudden, you might realize, add 1 to the exponent. I'll still have this h squared on the bottom, but then I'd have to divide by 3. You'd say, that's why we divide by 3 in our cone formula. That's why it's 1 third pi r squared. Well, we're going to see what the other parts are, but if you're memorizing for the longest time that it was 1 third, now you can see where that 1 third comes from. And we're still integrating from 0 to h. When I plug in h, I'm going to get r squared h cubed over h squared and 3. And this simplifies to 1 third pi r squared h. So it's really, really neat that you can derive these formulas now. Whereas that 1 third one up till now, you just sort of like, I don't know why it's 1 third. I'm just kind of visualizing it. It looks less than half, perhaps. But it's the calculus of what happens when we add 1 and divide by 3 where that 1 third shows up. Now, these are standard shapes that you have formulas for. But the power of the calculus is we can find ones for shapes like this one that we didn't have from before. Or, as we're going to see in the next one, I'm going to get you to try to draw it out as best as you can. Oh, 
I'll give you, I'll show you something before we get, before we get to this next one with sine and cos. Found a nice little, I found a nice little applet here. So what it does is it allows me to do nothing right now because it's frozen. Yes, it's frozen. Let's refresh this page. It allows me to type in any two functions. It used to allow me to type in any two functions. The function that comes up with to begin with is these two functions, and we're actually going to take the area between the two and rotate that, which is kind of similar to what your last example is going to do. The idea behind it is you take the volume of the upper one, do the complete volume of the upper one, and then do the complete volume of the one that's underneath, and once you subtract those two volumes, you're left with your new volume of your shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back here. And can you see that that shape line on the, sort of on a table there? And now we can slowly pick it up and rotate it around. And then I think they still have to work on some color coding in the middle here because I don't know if you can really see that it gets hollow in the middle there. But you might be able to see that better when I've taken part of it away. Whoa, not that much. Sweet, whoa, about that much. Then you can sort of see better what that shape looks like. So what this program allows me to do is it allows me to put in any function. So we can type in 0, and we can type in the square root of x like we had before. And we can look at what happens to our square root of x graph as we rotate it around. So our last function that we're going to look at just have a peek at the two functions that we got here. We're going to look at sine x and cos x. So cos x is going to be the function on the top here. And sine x is going to be the function on the bottom. And we are going from 0 to how much? Pi on 4. And if you did that on your calculator, pi divided by 4 is a decimal of 0.785. We'll go up to 0.8 to get a kind of idea. So our curves are on this flat part here. Can you see your coast graph here and your sine graph here and this gray part? is the area between them. So as we take this and rotate it around, oh, this is a nice one for visualizing. It kind of makes a dog bowl or a dish. Maybe the jets of an airplane, yes. And it's got a tiny, tiny, tiny hole there. So I guess you probably couldn't use it as a, as a water bowl, although water molecules probably couldn't fit through there. So it could still be used as a, a water bowl for a dog dish, if you'd like. So now if I was drawing this and trying to draw this on my own, <laughs> let's see how well. Again, this has already got the axes sort of flattened. And it, if, I, if I bring this back to 0, you can see that they've drawn sine and cos in three dimensionals on three axes. And that's not something that we normally do. So if I were to draw this starting with my axes like I normally do, my cos graph looking like that, 
and my sine graph looking like that, pi over 4 is right where they meet because you know from your unit circle that sine of pi over 4 and cos of pi over 4 are both root 2 over 2. So the things that are going to become important are this part and this part. And then coloring it in, this is the outside of my dog dish. And if you painted the inside of your dish a different color, and then all of this in here would be where it's hollowed out inside of your dog dish. Looks a little bit too green for me right now. There we go. I like a little bit of green in there to, to imagine it. Oh. Yeah, I think I can see that probably help that I gave you the actual image beforehand with a nice computer app, but there we go. So we need to find this out. And so the idea is you're going to take the volume of the bigger one and subtract the volume of the smaller one. Well, if we write those out, the volume of the bigger one is going to be from 0 to pi over 4 of cos, and because that's your radius, it's going to become squared, dx. And then you're going to subtract because if you tried to, if you did the derivative, if you integrated cos squared x by itself, it has a power rule, so you'd have to add 1 to the exponent, right, and divide by 3. But then it has a chain rule, and you don't have anything. You can't use in, uh, integration by substitution. And you can't just divide by sine x because that is another function. And so doing the integral of cos squared all by itself is difficult. It's not doable, it's not doable with the skills that I've given you. So I'm sorry about that. The same thing happens with sine squared. If you try to do that integral by itself, it's not doable. But I want you to try some stuff because if you're creative, you can manipulate this to get it into something that is doable. So I don't know if you want to take out some scrap paper because you don't want to mess up your notes or what you need to do. I'll hand out some scrap paper. But I want you to try and Think of different ways that you can manipulate this and be creative. First of all, I'll show the one method that some people came up with. Uh, that method looks like this. Everywhere, the first step is saying, well, I could factor out a pi, and then since the integral goes from the same values, I could just put this together as cos squared x minus sine squared x dx. Now, for the first way of dealing with this, because still you can't integrate cos squared, you can't integrate sine squared, but you might recognize this as one of your identities from last year. Cos squared minus sine squared is cos 2x. And cos 2x you can integrate. The integral 
of cos 2x will be sine 2x, but because there would be a chain rule and you'd have to multiply by 2, you'd have to divide by 2 and go from 0 to pi over 4. Plugging that in, what do we get? sine of pi over 2 is 1. And so this becomes 1 half minus 0. <coughs> so we get a final volume of our dog dish to be pi over 2. Yes? Okay. Method number 2. Method number two what Jia Ling thought of and what is a great thing to think of when you're stuck, we'll see if I can factor something. And this is the difference of squares. So if I factor it, at first it seems like this is getting larger and more complicated. But now we've got two things. And if we think of this as our original function, what's the derivative of that? The derivative of that is this. So we might be able to use substitution. Because the derivative of sine is cos, and the derivative of cos is negative sine. So if we let u equal cos x plus sine x, then du will be negative sine x plus cos x dx. And our complicated integral through substitution just becomes whew, u du. And integrating that, just becomes u squared. Oh, pi on 4, thank you. Got a little crazy. Did I? S oh, it was good up there. Okay. u squared over 2. So now we can substitute that back in. And this is where this one gets a little bit messier, I'll say, because we're going to have to do cos x plus sine x all squared. So now if we plug in pi over 4, cos of pi over 4 and sine of pi over 4 are both root 2 over 2. So you'll get root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2, all divided by 2, and the top part is squared, minus plugging in 0 is a little bit easier. Cos of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0. That's going to be all squared over 2. Root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2 is 2 root 2 over 2s, which is just going to be root 2. And when I square root 2, I get 2. Oh, there we go. 
and then this is a half, and we get pi over 2 that way as well. So both methods give us pi over 2. Method 1, which I've already erased, but what was hard was recognizing this as one of your identities. And if I think of the things you're going to forget on an exam, some of those identities that you haven't used very often are going to be the ones you're not going to think of. Okay? So that was the hard part in method one. But once you thought of that, the rest, the integration, and even plugging in the values was probably simpler. For this method, the factoring, you're not going to forget how to factor. And whenever you're trying to be creative, that should be in your box of creative tools. Like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. What's in my box of creative tools? Have you tried factoring? Oh, I should go back and try factoring something. <laughs> and this factors. And then to recognize this as substitution, I think, is easier than recognizing that double angle identity. Implementing the substitution and figuring it out, there's a little bit more complicated as far as figuring out the values. You've got more calculations to do. And so your calculation part and the sub integration by substitution is where this one is a little bit harder than the other one. But it's all on that point where what do I think of? What can I be creative with to figure this out? I had never thought of factoring it because I saw the double angle identity right away. And so seeing a new method, oh, made my day. So you've got some <laughs> over 10 minutes left, so there's lots of time to get started and working on these. <laughs>